Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim. I'm the exhibit technician here at the Mariners Museum. Uh, in a moment, John Corstein will be presenting on the 1862 Siege of Yorktown. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to get a few housekeeping things out of the way. Uh, first of all, I just want to let you know that we'll have images related to the talk available in the description. I'm sorry, in the link in the description below. Uh, second, we'll have a short Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. So please put any uh, you know, like questions that you have uh, in the live chat and John will try to answer them at the end. Uh, lastly, uh, please subscribe to the channel, hit that notification button to get more Mariners Museum content delivered to you. And uh, we're excited to expand this capability and have more stuff like this coming in the future. So now I'm gonna turn it over to John and uh, thanks for watching. It is amazing how Magruder paraded his 10,000 before McClellan like fireflies and utterly deluded him. Those were the words of Mary Boykin Chestnut regarding the siege of Yorktown. My name is John Corstein. I'm a director emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum and Park. And today we're gonna learn all about the siege of Yorktown. And I like to call it the second siege of Yorktown because I wanna tell you all the soldiers that were there in Yorktown in April of 1862, all were reminiscent about what had happened there in 1781. If you were a uh, unionist, you would have said, ah, here we are at Yorktown where our country was born and where we will preserve it. If you were a southerner like Vines Edmund Turner, who would say, I'm here at the very spot where Cornwallis surrendered to gain our independence. It is my hope now that we will gain our own. Of course, he was a Confederate versus the Union. Anyway, <clears throat> on March 6, 1862, George McClellan had been under pressure by President Abraham Lincoln to move his army against the Confederates. He had created this huge army and would parade it through the streets of Washington. McClellan appeared everywhere on his huge horse, Devil Dan Webster, riding from conference to camp, but never coming up with an exact plan. McClellan said, if you don't intend to use your army, may I borrow it? And with that, McClellan says, well, what I want to do is go down the um, Chesapeake Bay, go up the Rappahannock River, land at Urbana, and march straight across to Richmond. Because Joe Johnson, the commander of the main Confederate army in Virginia, uh, had 45,000 men near Manassas, Virginia. Now, what's going to happen is, is that Joe Johnson is already nervous about what the Federals may do, so he will retreat on March 6. 1862, back down to what we call the Rappahannock uh, Rapidan Line or Fredericksburg, and there he awaits. Now, McClellan's plan was to interdict his army between Joe Johnson and, of course, Richmond, and that would give him an advantage. But now that advantage was gone. So McClellan, on March 8th, 1862, goes and sees Lincoln and he says, oh, I can go by way of the Virginia Peninsula using my base as Fort Monroe, and I can march up the peninsula using the James and York River to carry my troops, my supplies, and guard my flanks. It is a brilliant plan. Of course, he would say that. But the trouble is, as we all know, on March 8, 1862, the Confederate ironclad ram, the CSS Virginia, will emerge from the Elizabeth River, striking the Union fleet, sinking the capital ships known as the USS Congress and the USS Cumberland. Actually, the Cumberland is rammed by the Virginia. The Virginia then will damage several other Union ships, it also destroy several transports. And Lincoln, when he hears about this, he says, this is the worst calamity to strike the Union since Bull Run. Everyone worried what would, they would call it the Merrimack, what would that ship do? Meanwhile, McClellan 
believes that the monitor that will arrive the next day and stop the attacks of the Virginia on the Union wooden ship would be sufficient for him to continue with his campaign. That is on March 10th. Actually, Gustavus Vassa Fox says, well, only so much reliance can be made on the monitor. I'm sure she'll win, but you never know what may happen in a battle. So McClellan begins on March 17, bringing his huge army down to the peninsula. He has 121,500 men, 14,592 animals. Uh, he has a 1,200 vehicles, 44 artillery batteries, and 102 siege guns. This is the largest army ever seen on the North American continent and the largest amphibious operation to date uh, during the Civil War. So I have to tell you, he will begin bringing his men down. Now, the commander of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, Louis Machibres Goldsboro, is not so sure how much he can support McClellan. McClellan's plan is based on Navy support. In fact, he uh, says, well, don't rely too much on me, but McClellan goes ahead with his plan. In fact, as his troops begin arriving in Fort Monroe and also at Camp Butler on Newport News Point, Basically, uh, John Gross Bernard, the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac will say, we should attack Norfolk first. And so we don't have to worry about that Confederate ironclad. McClellan says, no, we're gonna besiege Yorktown because the maps I have and information from the commander of Fort Monroe, John Ellis Wool said, Magruder has 15,000 men at Yorktown and his flank is exposed. So the Union Army is going to begin its march on April 4th, 1862. They will actually have two columns going up the peninsula, one taking the Hampton-York Highway. Uh, that is going to be two corps commanded by the second corps commanded by Edwin Vose Sumner and the third corps commanded by Brigadier General Samuel Heinzelman. Okay, so they're going up this road that's called a highway, but it's a muddy track. And then to flank Magruder and trap him in Yorktown, will come up from Camp Butler, uh, Rasmus Darwin Kays with his fourth corps. At the evening of April 4th, they have reached the first line. Now I gotta tell you, the Confederates, Magruder has built three defensive lines across the peninsula. The first one went from Deep Creek off the James River to Young's Mill, then over to Howard's uh, Bridge on the Pocosin River. But the main line was along the Warwick River, where Magruder was told by Robert E. Lee that was the best place on the peninsula to defend Richmond. Then there, there was a third line known as the Williamsburg Line, 14 readouts between Queens Creek and College Creek. Well, let me just tell you. What's gonna happen is as they reach the Confederate fortifications, Young's Mill, Howard's Bridge, Rasmus Darwin Kays actually says, these fortifications, if manned, would have stopped us for at least two weeks. See, the Confederates were playing a delaying game. They had fallen back to the Warwick River line. And so on April 5th, they began their march. And I have to tell you right now, it started to rain in torrents. In fact, the roads became so bad that uh, one soldier said that he witnessed a mule sinking in a pothole all the way up to its ears, mother. And it was a small mule, however. Well, as they move up the Hampton Road, also known as the Great Warwick Road. They'll come to Lee's Mill and there Brigadier General Lafayette McLaws has 1,800 men. Now, I gotta tell you, he has almost 20,000 men. McLaws has 1,800 men. And as a result of that, McLaws lays down a fire that stops the Federals in their track. Erasmus Darwin Case sends a message to McClellan and says, I will not reach the halfway house today. I am blocked by the Confederates along the Warwick River with a defensive system that can only be taken with a great effusion of blood. Well, I gotta tell you, 
K stops. Heinzelman and Sumner get to Yorktown, which is defended by a whole series of fortifications. In fact, the Confederate fortifications are a 12 mile long line going from Mulberry Island following the Warwick River to right near Yorktown, then to Yorktown and then across the river to what is known as Gloucester Point. The Confederates have these water batteries. So April 5th, McClellan knows, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. He contacts uh, Flag Officer Goldsboro. And Goldsboro is suffering a terrible disease at this time known as Ram Fever or Merrimack on the Brain. He refuses to help uh, McClellan by running his ships past the York River Battery, saying that the Merrimack will attack us from the rear. Well, his intelligence is bad because the Merrimack on that day was in dry dock. Nevertheless, what will happen after a couple of days, you know, it becomes apparent McClellan is stopped. And part of the reason is because Magruder began moving his troops up and down the fortifications with great fanfare. He's actually nicknamed Prince John Magruder for all his flamboyance uh, that he does during the pre-war army. And so as a result of that, McClellan begins to think that Magruder doesn't have 15,000 men doesn't have 50,000 men. He has 200,000 men defending the Warwick River. And he says, I need reinforcements. They send up balloons by Thaddeus Stanislaus Cortland Lowe. A Professor Lowe will have two balloons, the Intrepid and the Constitution, that look down on the Confederate lines. But they can't tell really how many soldiers are there. Alan Pinkerton, the great detective, is there with McClellan, who gathers information from one array slave, runaway slaves known as contraband. And they say, oh, they're all sorts of Confederates. In fact, one Confederate newspaper will say that each one of McClellan's Corps commander, commanders are expecting a daily visit from the much plumed cap and gaudy attire of the master of ruses and strategy, Prince John Magruder. Once again, Magruder, who was the victor at Big Bethel on June 10th, 1861, becomes in the pantheon of Southern heroes. He was considered one of the most outstanding people serving in the Confederate Army at that time because he's blocking. McClellan's first task force is over 67,000 men. So with 15,000, he's bluffing his way. So what does Magruder do? He causes McClellan to declare a siege. And as Magruder himself would say, through the woodland, uh, we could see fortifications being constructed. What McClellan decided to do was to use those 102 siege guns he had brought to the peninsula, really intended to bombard Richmond when they got up to Richmond, but instead he was going to bombard uh, Yorktown and force the Confederate surrender. Uh, one Union soldier will say, Thomas Lyman, that it is strange that we are using the implements of peace, pick, shovel, axe and spade to win this war. Well, McClellan has like 200 pounder parrot guns, 100 pounder parrot guns, 13 inch seacoast mortars. And he has the finest collection of artillery brought to one point any time in the Civil War and actually world history. So as he's doing that, some of his officers are saying, look, this Confederate line is not as thick as you all think. Um, it, it can be broken. And the one spot they think they can break it is at the place called Dam Number One. See, Magruder had taken the sleepy stream known as the Warwick River and had added to the two tide mill dams that existed and built three other dams. So he would back up the water, he chopped down all the trees. So there were great indudations and problems for the Federals to try and attack. Well, what's gonna happen is that Baldy Smith, uh, William Fahar Smith, uh, will actually go to McClellan saying, look, we can break through at this place called dam number one. 
on April 15th, 1862, McClellan goes to dam number one. He rides amongst his troops, lighting his cigar from their pipes and cheering them on. Tomorrow, we may break through the Confederate lines because he orders Baldy Smith to make an attempt to break through the Confederate lines. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that the effort by the Union is going to be misused because Baldy Smith uses elements of the 3rd Vermont 200 volunteers to cross the dam number one and to attack the Confederates on the other side. Actually, they are taken by surprise uh, and the Confederates fall back and try to be rallied by Brigadier General Hal Cobb, he used to be Secretary of the Treasury, governor of Georgia. This guy stands on the earthworks, clapping his hand, go shoot those Yankee SOBs, I guess I should say. So anyway, uh, the big thing is, is that the Vermont, as they cross the river, Baldy Smith had given Alonzo Hutchinson a white handkerchief, said, wave this when you get over there and I'll send you, send you reinforcements. Well, I got to tell you, Alonzo Hutchinson was mortally wounded. The Vermonters had had their ammunition get wet during the crossing of beside oh, sides of dam number one. And there they are in the rifle pits of the Confederates under heavy fire, thanks to the rally of Hal Cobb. And the man falls upon a man known as Samuel Pingree, who lost a thumb, is wounded in the hip, and finally he realizes no reinforcements are coming, so he orders a withdrawal. As they go back across the Warwick River, one person said the river boiled like sap, the amount of gunfire that was happening. In fact, most of the Vermonters of casualties took place during that fallback. Right now is a little period of history or heroism because a musician, 15-year-old Julian Scott, will cross the Warwick River five times to pick up wounded comrades. And one of them is a man known as William Scott, no relation. He had been known as the Sleeping Sentinel. That's right, Lincoln, you know, when the Vermonters were outside of Washington on guard, William Scott fell asleep at his post. He was court-martialed, you know, for dereliction of Judy. They were going to shoot him, but Lincoln rides up at the very end and says, oh, no, don't do that. Um, I will pardon him. Well, he tells Lincoln at that time, I am ready to lay down my life for my country at any time. And he did so there at dam number one. He was mortally wounded, brought back across by Julian Scott. Well, the Federals try to launch another attack, but it fails. And the stalemate continues along the Warwick River. President Jefferson Davis and his military advisor, Robert E. Lee, will tell Joe Johnson to take his army down to the peninsula to strengthen the defenses. Johnson says, look, these fortifications are poorly built. No general other than McClellan would have hesitated to have attacked. And as a result of that, uh, the siege continues. Johnson wants to retreat very badly. And Lee wants him to stay there because they have to actually went from volunteers to a conscripted army. So they have to vote in new officers. They also have to have a better organization. And so as McClellan is almost ready to unleash his bombardment, the Confederates slip out of their trenches on May 3rd, 1862. They will slip out at night under a huge bombardment. Uh, actually, when Magruder is told that they are to retreat, he looks, according to one observer, he looks at his little army and he's there worn out from the arduous duties of the past four weeks, a strain enough to have killed any man. He leans up his elbow and points to his little army and says, sick transit Gloria Peninsula, or I leave the peninsula with faded glory. Well, I have to tell you, the siege of Yorktown has gained the Confederacy 30 days to bring more soldiers up to Richmond to defend. Also, the Virginia has blocked the James River and has protected Norfolk. And we'll learn 
sometime soon what happens after the Confederate retreat. So I uh, thank you for, on behalf of the Mariners Museum and Park, uh, for watching this brief review of the Siege of Yorktown. I'm going to tell you right now, you can go out and see much of the fortifications, both Union and Confederate. And also, uh, you can learn more about the ironclads involvement in this siege uh, by going to the Mariners Museum. So, as I like to say, that the Confederates won an extra day, thanks to the Virginia, and also thanks to the heroics of the master of ruses and strategy, Prince John Magruder. So, I'm ready to take some questions. Um, I got one, did Joe Johnson ever not retreat? Well, I gotta tell you, he didn't at Seven Pines. The trouble with Johnson is he wanted to preserve his army, not territory. So like during the Atlanta campaign, he had a beautiful position at Kennesaw Mountain. Um, he defeated the Federals there. However, um, they were flanked. He had a smaller army than William Sherman. So that was his idea was not to defend a city like Vicksburg or Richmond. He wanted to fight outside of them. And if he couldn't, he wanted to preserve his army. So I think it was a, a pretty um, typical of Joe Johnson. Uh, he was a brilliant officer. Uh, but Jefferson Davis, they both didn't like each other. In fact, they courted the same girl at West Point and they got in fisticuffs over it. So, you know, uh, Johnson thought Davis was a nouveau riche planner from Mississippi, whereas he would carry his grandfather's sword that he received during the American Revolution. So he rattled it sometimes when he was around uh, President Davis. So, anyway, so how common was the use of hot air balloons to collect field intelligence. Well, that's a whole nother big story, but to tell you shortly, in July of 1861, uh, Jacques Lamontagne will bring a balloon down to Fort Monroe, observing the Confederate fortifications. All of a sudden they realize the value of these hot, well, these are gas balloons, believe it, hydrogen balloons. And so um, Lamontagne uh, will not be as successful as Thaddeus Lowe. Thaddeus Lowe actually has a barge called the GW Custis and he, GWP Custis. And actually that barge will come up towards Yorktown and he'll launch two balloons. Now, the gathering of intelligence is good. Actually, George Custer goes up in a balloon at Warwick Courthouse. And he was so afraid, he hugged the bottom of the basket. When they finally got up about 1,500 feet, he stood up and he said, this is amazing. I could see Fort Monroe. I can see the James River. I can see the York River. This is an amazing intelligence gathering. They just didn't know how to use the gathering. And Magruder, of course, had kept all his camps in the woods, so they really couldn't count tents and so forth. That's what enabled Magruder to surprise him so much. Uh, yes, this is the same Bull Sumner who was at Manassas. And I have to tell you, Bull Sumner uh, is uh, in his 60s. Uh, he'd been in the US Army since 1819. He got his nickname Bull for two reasons. Number one, they said he could bellow over the sound of battle but they also said he was just bullheaded because during a uh, skirmish during the Mexican War, a spent ball hit him straight in the middle of the forehead and bounced off. So they said, well, you know, he's hard-headed, and so we can't count that anyway. So uh, Bull Sumner um, has gotten a little old. He'll continue with the Army of the Potomac through the Battle of Sharpsburg and Tetum, September 17th. He falters during that battle. And so that is uh, um, just, you know, he, he, he dies uh, in 1863. So anyway, Sumner doesn't really have a good civil war. Now, the next question is, yes, Cobb did command the 16th Georgia, uh, 15th North Carolina and 2nd Louisiana. And I have to tell you that um, they, uh, were the ones, the 15th North Carolina were in the frontline trenches. They had just gotten there. 
And so they were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel William McKinney, who's a VMI graduate. And when the Federals all of a sudden show up on the other side of the Warwick River, his men run by sheep, chased by dogs. He stands up on an earthwork trying to rally his men and was shot through the forehead. It is Hal Cobb who will then will organize the brigade so he can make a successful counterattack. Uh, someone asks, did Magruder drink too much? Well, I have to tell you, there are stories of Magruder's drinking. In fact, uh, uh, if I had more time, I'd tell you more about it. But let me just say that uh, one time he's at Fort, Mc Fort McHenry uh, in the 1830s. He's at a party. He drinks so much that he passes out in the mail cart. They can't wake him up. They mail him with the mail to Washington, D.C. He wakes up, says, where am I? And I'm not in Baltimore. And he pulls a flask out of his uh, jacket and has a swig and finds his way back home. Now, when he wins the Battle of Big Bethel on June 10th, 1861, I'll tell you, Jefferson Davis once thinks he should be promoted. So does Robert E. Lee. However, Davis knows all about his drinking. So he'll have Lee send Magruder a note saying, uh, you know, we really think you did a great job at Big Bethel. You are an outstanding officer. However, we know you drink a little bit extra. And so uh, we want you to sign a pledge that you will no longer drink spiritous liquors through the rest of the war. Magruder writes back immediately, I have not allowed a touch a spiritus liquors to pass my lips since the war began and I shall not ever again. But I gotta tell you, that did not stop Magruder from drinking brandy and champagne and taking laudanum. Uh, so, you know, he uh, is actually being blamed for drunkenness at the Battle of Malvern Hill, but he was still an outstanding uh, defensive leader. He, graduate of West Point, class of 1830. There's a lot of things you can say so much about him. And, uh, but Magruder, his star rised. In fact, he was considered the frank and manly representative of the chivalry of the dear old dominion. Well, I think I've taken a little too long. And of course, uh, you just get me started, but nevertheless, I do hope I have a blog. Uh, on the Siege of Yorktown. This one that I put out yesterday was all about the navies during uh, the Siege of Yorktown. I will have a subsequent blog about the siege itself, and I'll follow that with what happens to uh, the move up the peninsula with the Battle of Williamsburg, so forth. So once again, on behalf of the Mariners Museum, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us today. And I hope you'll join in with us again sometime soon. Thank you.